Today's Animal Spirits is brought to you by YCharts. Lots of good data and resources from YCharts. They have their monthly market wrap, top 10 visuals resource desk. I look at the good top 10 list. Quarterly economic survey, all this stuff. It's, it's almost hard to un- get through all of the data that they have on there and find it sometimes. So I like it when they put it all together for you, consolidate it. Are you a list uh, guy? Big list guy. Yeah, are Everyone's you? a list person, right? Yeah. I feel like, uh, I don't know if that's like a tipping point. Like my dad's a big list guy. He'll like just write down top 10 and just share it with me. Oh, his own? Okay. <laughs> he like, he does a one-on-one podcast with you. Yeah. So after the end of the quarter, YCharts also does their economic update visual deck. So everything from interest rates and macroeconomic data, it's all client friendly, PowerPoint deck ready. You can just add your own logo on there. We do. So go to YCharts. Uh, check the show notes where you can download that visual deck. Uh, also register for YCharts Economic Update Q1 2024 on May 2nd. Very nice. Lots of updates here. Don't forget 20% off your initial subscription when you start your free YCharts trial. Tell them Animal Spirit sent you. That's for your initial subscription. YCharts.com. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. Uh, what's in your ear? What is it? What are those? Those are not AirPods, are they? I, I lost my AirPods and I have these beats ones as a backup and i have to say i'm it's not ideal because they're the sound canceling ones it screws with your equilibrium i do not like i'm a big fan of the bose like over the ear noise canceling i don't want like the these, noise are, canceling. these are bose ones what's that yeah these are uh, beats or bose and no but i don't like know. the i don't like the can- noise canceling inside of your ear i like the over the ear noise canceling yeah it, it's it's a weird sensation i don't like them either then last week I podcast s- problems. The podcast, pro- yeah. I said that Pacer uses uh, free cash flow yield to identify growth companies. That was on me. That was this is this is attraction. I'm issuing attraction. Uh, actually, they use free cash flow margin. Attraction or retraction? That, that was a Howard Stern reference. That was a very niche. That was a very niche okay. reference. Over if, my head. If you know, you know. Uh, and there's a difference. So the free cash flow margin, that's free cash flow over sales as opposed to the yield, which it's been a while since the CFA days, but I would think that would be over the earnings. So there you have it. Traction issued. Hand up. Okay. Free cash flow at enterprise value. Isn't it funny when we did the CFA, you literally had to learn all of those ratios. You remember the differences between, there was like six different ways to get to free cash flow to the firm. And then there was also a different me- metric free cash flow to equity. Do I know what the difference between either of those are? <laughs> Can I even calculate free cash flow? Uh, if I'm being honest, no, I don't remember that formula. There was like, uh, you start here and you back out six things and you add two. I had pages and pages of formula cheat sheets. Yeah. Yeah. Not very helpful now. Um, all right. One more California announcement. I don't think we announced this on the show. Maybe we did, maybe we didn't, but I'm gonna do it anyway. On April 30th, Josh and I are doing a live podcast in Los Angeles in the downtown area, the arts district, I think it's called. And our first guest that we're revealing is Matt Bellany. And I cannot wait. I listen to the guy every single week on the town podcast. We talk about him a lot here. Love his podcast. I read him at the puck. He is, uh, this is a, uh, I was about to say the Mike Francesa of Hollywood. That's not true because he's not, but, uh, but he's got his, he's got his finger on the pulse. Let's say that. So he had the CEO of IMAX on last week. Did you listen to that one? I did. I, it got me a little, uh, a little intrigued in the stock. So the interesting thing was he said, so IMAX made up less than 1% of Dune 2 theaters, right? Because IMAX, it isn't everywhere, but it it was 22% of the revenue or something like that. Just mind boggling, right? Yeah. I, we're going to put a pin in this because I have more to add when we get into recommendations. I saw Civil War and I've got, I've got some takes on the IMAX, AMC, et cetera, et cetera. All right, Ben, what's on your mind? All right. Uh, where's our correction? We're in it. Like, let's do it. This So as of through Monday, we're taping. We don't do the time and date anymore as much. That used to be your thing. It's Tuesday morning. Well, sometimes I like to give a timestamp. I should do it more often just so that the audience knows, hey, listen, it's possible that we're not talking about something that came out after we're recording. We're recording pre-market Tuesday morning. Uh, so the S&P as of close on Monday was down 3.7%. That's the, the biggest what about drawdown. The Probably pretty close. They're in correction territory, I would guess. Let's see. It just seems with everything we've like, let's do this. This is this this is nothing. 
You call this a correction? No. <laughs> you know the remember the scene from uh Crocodile Dundee where he says, That's not that's not a knife. This is a knife. <laughs> right? Like we, we the need cues a are only down three point four percent from their highs too. Wow. It with with everything going on in the world, with inflation being sticky and the Fed not cutting and war in the Middle East and all this stuff. I guess I, I'm surprised that we're not down more. I'm surprised too. But listen, be careful what you wish for. Give it a day or two. That's true. Oh, hey, corrections are a good thing for many investors. I agree. Right? So they're necessary. Just, uh, I don't want to say evil. They're, they're, they're just a part of it. I, w- I was thinking last week, trying to come up with a name because we like to label things. It's fun. You know, a lot of people in relationships in like high school are like, I'm, I'm not, I don't like labels, right? That's what you're saying. We don't want to date someone. I don't like labels. What are we? <laughs> but, but I'm a, I, yeah, yes. What, let's define this. I'm a label guy. So I, I'm, I'm going to tag this the yeah, but bull market. Not bad. Okay. Because I feel like there is a yeah, but for everything. Yeah, but government debt. Yeah, but deficit spending. Yeah, but market concentration. Yeah, but inflation. This is the yeah, but bull market. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Okay. Jamie Dimon was, I don't know if you read his investor letter, but it was, it was written as if we were in a global crisis and there are obviously many issues in this country and all over the world as there always are, but it was just weird not to be celebrating any of the uh, success that we've had or any of the progress that we've made, which is undoubtable. Uh, even David Solomon in his opening remarks on his on the call, um, it was positives certainly more positive than Diamond was, but also the yeah, but there was a lot of yeah, buts. Yeah, but. I think it's it's harder than ever these days to be positive or optimistic and not be negative and cynical. I think I think it's never been harder to to take a more sunny approach to life. Well, I don't know about that. Never been harder? You don't think that we're just, I feel like we're just inundated with negativity and complaining and I, I I was going to talk about this later, but someone made a comment last week, and it said uh, if Ben was president, he would criminalize complaining about inflation. And uh, we we had a lot of people that that actually a handful of people emailed us and said uh, I actually like the balance in animal spirits because Ben is looking at the economy and inflation through a more rational numbers approach, and Michael is more empathetic, uh, which doesn't paint me in the best light, obviously, but. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I've been trying to look at it through a more clear lens of of just the numbers and I'm and obviously I know, but my whole point is I feel like with social media and the and the internet and everyone having an opinion, uh like complaining is is turning into a personality trait. Yeah, it's in vogue and I don't like it. Because it's an easy way to get other people to coalesce around you. Yeah. And so my thing is like I understand that there are people who are, the, there's bad things going on. And the thing is, the world has always had really crappy stuff happening in it. It's just never been easier to under, like to be hit over the head with it. And that's why I try to provide a sunnier outlook because I'm trying to negate that a little bit. So I I get it that people complain and people are in a bad position, even though like the overall economy is doing well. My whole point is, I think sometimes people need to hear the the hard truth of, complain, get it out of your system, and then move on and deal with it. Sometimes you just have to play the hand you're dealt. And that's that's not like an easy thing to hear, but I think that's- Yeah, listen, when I went bald, did I complain? No, I just wore a hat for 10 years. Did you turn into a big hat guy? Is that, oh, like, is that why you wear hats well, all the time? Well I, I, well, I was always a hat guy, but once I started to go bald, the yeah, hat never came off. Okay. I can see that. That makes a lot of sense. See, you, you, <laughs> you played the hand you were dealt. <laughs> You turn into a black hat guy. Uh, we have talked a lot about in the last few weeks, like holding ten baggers, right? Like the people who have the ability to hold Nvidia all the way through all the crashes and and the big gains and not sell after like a hundred percent gain. And we heard a bunch of good feedback from people on this and and how they do it and that sort of thing. But it, it got me thinking, like, wait a minute, we're we're gonna hold a ten bagger eventually. It's just it's gonna be in an index fund. So I had our chart wizard, Matt, run this for me. And I, I, I looked at the investing at the beginning of each year going back to 1980. And like, when was the last time we had a 10-bagger? And actually, if I wanted to, to really cherry pick the data, from the bottom in March of 2009, it's a 10-bagger. Oh, wow. 
I assume right? this is total oh, return. Total returns. Not but the, the last year, if you did the beginning of a year, it was like 1997 is a 10-bagger. Starting at 2009 is pretty close. It's a seven-bagger. But if you go to the early 80s, we're talking 100-baggers. Uh, early 90s is like a 30-bagger. So the, the longer you, you, longer out you go, even in the regular stock market, there's, there's baggers there. I am doing some work on the likelihood of picking a 10-bagger in a stock and what do the 10-baggers have in common. It's complicated. It's a complicated exercise because, well, the data is hard to get. Like if you look at the Russell 3000 going back to 1990, I think like only 15% of the stocks today were even in it back then. So I'm All working right. on it. I'm working on it. Once I have what I have, what I need, there will be a blog post. There will be charts. So when do you think, how long do you think it's taken NVIDIA to be a 10-bagger? Like going from right now, how far back do you have to go for it to, to invest in it, be a 10-bagger? Um, I looked at this. 2017? It's like 2020. You invested in the spring of 2020. Not even the bottom. It was like May. That's a 10. NVIDIA is a 10-bagger. <laughs> kind of amazing, right? Well, but there was a 70-plus percent drawdown in there. And that's the thing. True. All right. Torsten Slock. A regular on the show, the U.S. produces more oil than Russia and Saudi Arabia. This is global crude oil, and the U.S. is number one, Russia two, Saudi Arabia three. And I, I pulled up the, the chart of oil, uh, and it's essentially gone nowhere for the past eh, 15 years or so. I mean, it's rising a little bit, and but it's it's really gone. If you took like the average of oil over the last 15 years, we're probably at average. So we have simultaneous, this is back to like the correction thing, simultaneous wars in Ukraine and Middle East. And oil has gone nowhere for 15 years. Macro is really, really hard. I, I, I wouldn't have believed that. Remember we hit 120 in the spring of 2022, February. right when the war started? Oil is still down 30% since mm. then. I, yeah. I'm just, this is, it's, it's another surprising thing to me. Yeah. Yeah, I don't maybe, know. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm maybe I'm jinxing it. Like the stock market's going to roll over ten percent from here, and oil is going to shoot up twenty percent. Now that I'm saying this, I don't know anything about the dynamics of the oil market. If I'm being completely honest, I just I don't know with the first thing about it. I think that maybe the point though is even the experts don't either. Because how many of the experts said two hundred dollars a barrel? Here it comes. Fair. True. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe no one does. Ben, we've spoken a lot over the years and more recently about index funds and. The fact that there are over 50% of all assets in mutual funds and ETFs, and what are they potentially doing to prices and price discovery and all that sort of good stuff. And all of that is debatable. Nobody, you know, I don't think we're going to get to the bottom of that and solve that. Um, but there's one part of it that I feel like surely we can do better. And when I say we, I mean the index committee, and I don't know what the solution might be. But here's what I'm talking about. Jeremy Schwartz, was this Jeremy? Or I know it was Wisdom Tree. Hold on, I don't think it was Jeremy, actually. Uh, oh, no, yeah, it was Jeremy. Joseph Atia is, is a research person, and Jeremy wrote a post, will the growth of indexing lead to its downfall? And they looked at what happens with the stock before in the periods before it gets added to the index versus after it's added to the index. And, they, and he compares it to what about the stocks that were dropped from the index? What happens before it's dropped and after it's dropped? It's not great. So one month before a company is added, let's stick with companies that are added. One month before it's up 4.4% on average, two weeks before it's 2.6%, and then a month after it's negative one, three months it's negative two, six months it's negative three, 12 months it's negative 5%. And then I'm not going to read the numbers, but it's effectively the exact opposite, but even more extreme from companies that are dropped. So 12 months after a company's dropped on average, it's up 16%. All right, so you get a lot of front running in both directions. So in terms of removing companies um, and then having them go on to have good performance, that's out of their control, right? Because they're removing companies almost by definition that just don't meet the criteria anymore. And they don't meet the criteria because they're not great companies. And therefore, the stock prices don't aren't good, right? So the so, question is, why do they need to make this public? I know yeah. they have to tell the ETF providers and stuff. Why do they have to tell everyone yeah, else? Yeah, can't there be like an embargo or something? Now, there's always going to be people that like figure out what's coming and going. Um, but I feel like there's got to be a better way. 
I agree with you. Instead of saying whatever weeks or months in advance, we're going to add these stocks or, or however long they give you. It's a couple weeks, I guess. Why why give investors the ammo to front run these stocks or get out early? Yeah, I, that, that, exactly. It makes no sense. So I don't know, but I just feel like there's got to be a better way. Okay, so I think last week I mentioned to you, was it, was it on this show? I can't remember. They, they all kind of run together. But why have historically equity allocations been so low? And then you wrote a blog post about this, that things are actually improving. Yeah, so Vanguard did a post and they show the broad asset mix of US domiciled mutual funds and ETFs. And historically, let's say from ETF's inception, the spiders started So this would be like the allocation of fund investors. Right, right. If you put them all together. Right. So the spiders started trading in 1993. And from 93 through the run-up into 2000, and, and this isn't just ETFs. Again, it's mutual funds as well. Uh, the household, let's just say household allocation to equities doubled. It went from 30%, 33% to 62%. And then with the crash it dropped all the way down to 40%, the allocation to equities. And then right at the peak in 07, it ran up again to 63%, but before crashing back down to 36%. That 2009 period is wild. So money markets overtook stocks at the bottom. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, they did. Um, and then since... And then it's a 10-bagger since then. Since 2013, give or take, when we, when we reclaimed new all-time highs, the household allocation has been pretty steady, both in stocks, bonds, and money market funds. It is kind of um, funny that it's it's essentially 60-40 portfolio. It's, we always yeah. say, like, we debate a 60-40 portfolio, but no one actually holds it. But <laughs> together, yeah. fund investors do kind of hold a 60-40 portfolio if you it's, include it's bonds like and the, cash in the 40. It's like, how, it's like how the S&P 500 never has an average return. Yes, um, right. So their hypothesis, and I'm reading from the report, is that industry-wide changes in the delivery of investment advice and in the investment funds themselves, think target date funds, that's made Target dates, yes. Uh, for the improved results. Those include the widespread shift to fee-based rather than commission-based financial advice, uh, the related surging popularity of ETFs and model portfolios, and the dominance of target date funds. So there it is, and employer-sponsored retirement plans. I think that all is a large slice of the pie in terms of why the household mix has been less volatile. I also think somewhere in that pie, a not so insignificant slice, is it's been, depending on where you want to start the date, it has been a 15-year bull market, a 12-year bull market, whatever it is. It's been a long bull market. And so investors have been conditioned, I think rightfully so, to buy the dip, to take a long-term view that equities are the best game in town, and I think it's going to be really hard to undo this. I'm not saying it's. I'm not saying that this chart is permanent, that it can't be messed with, but I think that the investor behavior has changed, um, and I think the market is a part of that. But I think it would take like a 10 year bear market, at least, maybe with a crash in there, to change the behavior. Maybe I'm being over optimistic about the lessons that we've learned, but I think that this is. Uh, I think that this is a structural shift. Is it fair to say that the increased amount of information has actually helped on the margin too. People just know more about historical returns and that the fact that the stock market is your best long-term bet. That's a part of it too, for sure. Right. But I do think that there's something to the fact that baby boomers hold the majority of the money, right? Baby boomers are worth like $70 trillion or something. Th there They've is, lived through there was many a crashes. There was a cohort that just wants to say, I told you so, and would love to see this chart shift in a bear market, people are going to panic. Uh, well, we, we, we kind of just lived through that. <laughs> if 2020 wasn't a bear market and did, did equity to the allocation dip? Yeah, it did. Um, but it came right back and from 2022 all the way through just a couple of months ago, it was almost a two year bear market. Let's call it what it was. It was bear market. We had uh, steady hands. Google fell 50%. Amazon got cut in half over a two-year period. So if that's not a bear market, I don't know. You know, it's not a global financial crisis, but certainly this will th that period of time will go in the history the, the history books of a bear market because that's what it was. And investors uh, didn't really budge at all. So 
Quite a Kudos. Team. Everyone, people are coming. All right. I have, I want to take umbrage with some adjectives we use in the finance world. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can see I'm splitting hairs here, but I just want to put this out there. So last Wednesday, inflation came in hotter than expected. Everyone said inflation is hot. So hot. Expectations 3.3%, actual 3.4%. The next day, PPI, cooler than expected. So much cooler. 0.2 versus 0.3. I'm just, 0.1% is a literal rounding error anywhere else in life, but in finance, it's hotter or colder. I just Can want to throw that out there. Counterpoint, 0.4 versus 0.3 or 0.3 versus 0.2. Those are, those are large percentage increases. Yeah, that's not, yeah, that's fair. I'm just right. If you, say, if, you said, also, if you said this came in at 400, we were expecting 300. These numbers also get revised later. That's the thing too. That like, that's it, true. It could. <laughs> I I just think it's funny. This this is just the way we talk about stuff in finance. I know that's this is the way the game is played. Yeah. All right. So is inflation actually hot, or is it just a little higher than expected? All right. So here's here's where I'm holding hope on inflation. And obviously, inflation is one of the hardest things to predict. We've all seen it. It's it's. It's not easy to predict these last few years, especially. Ernie Tedeschi wrote that the excess in core CPI right now is much less broad than what we saw in 2022. In 2022, inflationary pressures hit many categories. In contrast, right now, there's only two that we'd expect under 2%, and that's housing, which is the lion's share, and auto insurance. And so the housing piece, you hope if you, Jeremy Schwartz has written about this a lot, if you use actual rental data from Zillow or Apartment List or one of those places, that OER is, is, should be coming down unless rent spike from here. The auto insurance thing though, that's a crazy one. And uh, I listened to TCAF and you guys were debating this on there too. And I put out the bat signal on Twitter and we got a bunch of emails about this. And so I've kind of, I've, I think I've pieced it together. I'm the guy, I'm the gif of Charlie Day on Always Sunny with the strings attached. I've been, I've been, <laughs> I've been in, in the lab working on the auto insurance. So look at this chart of auto insurance. This is from the BLS. This looks like a meme stock. It it fell a little bit actually in 2020 and it shot out of a cannon. And if you scroll down a little bit here, this I, I put US CPI motor vehicle insurance versus the regular CPI. It's not like you could say like, oh, because a lot of people said to me, well, it's greedflation. They're doing this because they can. And that always sounds like a good thing to people. But look at this. For 2021, 2022, auto insurance CPI was below the actual overall CPI. It's only really since 2023 that this took off. So those, I, I feel like 2021 and 2022 were the point where corporations could have taken advantage of consumers. So it's like, why is this happening now? Yeah, that's, a, that's an astute observation. Okay, so here is what I came up, and we got a, an excellent handful of emails from people. One guy sent us an email, he works in the insurance industry and just laid this out like yeah, piece by piece. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna great, lean on a lot of this. But, great email. So. One thing is car prices are just higher. So used car prices skyrocketed, right? We we saw that. So when that happens, the replacement cost for cars goes up. Obviously, insurance has to go up as well, right? I got into a fender bender a few years ago. It was just my rear bumper, maybe a side panel. It wasn't a big deal. And they, I paid only my deductible, obviously, but they gave me the estimate. And it was $15,000, which was like half the... Yes, and I, I'm like, why, how is it so expensive? And obviously, it was supply chain stuff and parts, but mm. all the sensors are in the bumpers now. You got the uh. camera and the sensor. And so with more technology in cars and with electric vehicles and then maybe now self-driving cars, the, the parts are going to be more expensive. So you see the CPI for maintenance and repair, that's higher. Obviously, labor is higher too. If you have more technical cars and vehicles, then it's going to cost more to service them. So labor has gone up. Obviously, inflation is part of that too. Other thing, we're driving bigger cars and SUVs and trucks, right? More expensive, more costly to repair. This one, this one was surprising me. I did not realize this. So we're at a last year we had a 40-year high in pedestrian fatalities. And one of the thing, one of the, a couple of the stories said when traffic was reduced on the road during the pandemic. The roads were more wide open, right? So people started driving faster. And they said, on average, people were driving 10 miles per hour faster and maybe a little more reckless. And that behavior didn't change once more cars came back on the road. So they're saying the pandemic caused people to drive more reckless. And the other thing is people have cell phones. How many times do you see someone staring down at their cell phone? All the time. Every time I'm on the I, car. It pisses me off. And when someone's like coming at you and they kind of jerk back, right? Right. And 
So that is a lot of studies have shown that's like worse than drunk driving. So you basically have like a bunch of drunk drivers on the road driving these bigger trucks and SUVs. And so that means there's more big accidents. That means more payouts from insurance companies. So okay? one of the things that I said on TCAF that I was dead wrong about apparently was like, I, I assumed that they were taking this to the bottom line. And I this, would have assumed that too. This emailer said, uh, an easy metric of profitability to look at an insurance is combined ratio for every dollar of premium coming in, how much is going out. Most insurance companies are losing somewhere between three and 15 cents for every dollar of premium they're earning right now. Uh, the exceptions are Geico. Their expense ratio is super low after massive layoffs. Progressive. But many others are still eating it from a profitability perspective. That, that blew my face right off my head. Yeah, so I, I was, I'm not going to lie. I'm surprised too. So it's not like these insurance companies are rolling in it. They're paying out so much more in claims than they're taking in in a lot of ways. And well, also, this also feeds into the feelings part of inflation because fucking insurance? You don't yes. see any benefit from that. It's yes. like, wait a minute. Why am I paying $400 more a year for something that, A, I don't even use, God willing, and B, I don't derive any, I don't like perceive any benefit from that. And when you, when you do use it, like in my case, when I had the fender bender, I thought, well, hey, I've been paying into insurance for decades now and never- <laughs> Right. Never filed a claim. So yeah. it, I, and the other thing, the last one is mother nature, right? So they're the natural disasters and climate. So I think the number was in the hurricane Ian in Florida, North Carolina, it was like 360,000 cars were damaged or destroyed. And the wall street journal had a piece about this for how it's affecting home insurance too. So it's not just auto insurance, home insurance, average annual home insurance cost rose 20% between 2021 and 2022 or 2023. Uh, another 6% increase is projected in 2024. Uh, so they say uh, rates rose by 10% in average in 19 states in 2023 after a series of big payouts related to flood, storms, wildfires, and other natural disasters across the U.S. So this is home and auto. So my question is, what stops this? What slows this down? Beats me. Remember that phrase? Like when you know the answer to something, you'd say beats me. <laughs> you don't hear that much anymore. But but it seems to me that a lot of these trends for again more electric vehicles and more technology in cars and people still driving these bigger vehicles, unless we ban cell phone usage in cars somehow, so you can't text and look at your phone like an idiot, what's going to stop this trend? I don't know. I don't think it's going to get better. I'm just learning about it. I'm just catching up. So yeah, I don't know. I have no idea. Anyway, that but uh, that that's the kind of like the the st other stuff for inflation makes sense to me. Like it, this the I think the trend is still like if you look at the wage growth, that that's still going down. The good news is it's still higher than inflation, but I think the other good news is if, if you're worried about the 1970s redux of people keep sending us the chart where it shows the 1970s inflation spiked, then it fell and it spiked again, saying we're following that chart. This is it. I think wages f continuing to fall is your one big out case against that, right? Wages are the thing. They are. Right? So I think that, and, and a lot of people are saying this. In fact, this is something that a lot of people got right about inflation. A lot of people were saying that the last mile was going to be the toughest part of it. And that's proving to be true. Yes. Going from three to two. I, I still, yeah. I'm still in the camp that three and a half percent essentially is the long-term average and we're there. Call I I I if I was the Fed I, they can't say this but they could yeah we're there. The, I'd be worried again if it was above four I guess that's when I'd call it hot. Well, you see the thing the the last week on TCAF we were talking about a chart from Michael McDonough over at Bloomberg, and he shows the components of CPI that are rising at more than four percent, and that's going a lot higher. More than you'd think. Yeah. So, you know, that part of it rolled over and it's, it really is reaccelerating. So this is another area though, where I feel like information is both good and bad. Like when did people, how many people in the seventies knew all the components of inflation? Five, like five economists in a room somewhere. Not th that, that That's kind of cool. And kind of that, that we can all just look at this data now, whenever we want, if you want to. Yeah. Thing is, people, there's a lot of people who don't even believe the data. 
Well, yes. I mean, <laughs> a lot of people. Like a yes. lot of people. Yes. Obviously, the data is imperfect, but the, I, the, the trend, that's what you want to understand. True. And, and there, is, there is true, and certain components of the data are certainly imperfect. Yes. But and we, in we, the aggregate. And, and we've always said, no household's actual average inflation equals to the overall average of the country. It's impossible because of the standard of where you live and what you spend on housing and what your household budget looks like. It's impossible for anyone to have the actual inflation rate of the average. It doesn't so happen. getting back to the insurance stuff, what's going on with home, home insurance? Well, that's the same thing. I, I, that, I meant to mention that too. It's just the, the, for, that, it's, for that, it's more climate change stuff, it seems like. And houses getting more expensive to build. And obviously, the inflation component. If, the, if housing prices rise 50% and your house gets destroyed, guess what? The insurance is going to have to be, make a bigger payout. So some of this is just general insurance and some of it is these idiosyncratic factors in these spots where it's not going to, it's not going to, this is another one that's, it's not going back, that's for sure. Unless, I, I mean, I guess you could see with autos more of, of auto prices falling, but unless everyone decides to turn in their SUV and their truck for a Honda Accord, like my dream is, I, these, these rates aren't going back. Here's another one that's not going back. We got retail sales yesterday. Warmer than expected. Um, look at the, again, Michael McDonough has this great chart. He breaks it down. Non-store retailers versus general merchandise stores. And non-store retailers, that's just, that's online. And They got to come up with a better name than that. I saw, I keep seeing non-store retailers. I, why don't we just call it e-commerce? Yeah, they must have came or, up with that or name before online or, people spend a lot online. Yeah, it just doesn't sound right. You know, it's, but it's, what, what's interesting is the online piece of it is just that's a secular shift higher and there's no slowing that one down but look how look at the like jump we had during covid and we a, a little bit of that came back as the economy reopened but we're pushing back towards all-time highs if you wanted like one graph to understand the economy it's this isn't it we just keep spending and obviously higher inflation is a piece of this too but we just we love to consume in this country in this chart, did anything stand out to you in terms of the components? It's very pretty. It's the colors are see. very pretty. Colors are pretty. Uh, I mean, it's the non-store thing, right? Yeah, that was a big one. What happened in March? Was it Cyber Monday? I don't know. That is a good question. Just, we like to spend. Okay. Uh, another one from Torsen Slock. The Getting back to the travel boom. Because of significant rise in the stock market and significant cash flows from fixed income, U.S. households have more money to travel on airplanes, stay at hotels, eat at restaurants, go to sporting events, amusement parks, and concerts. That is why inflation in the non-housing service sector continues to be so high. He shows, again, a record high share of the population is planning to go on vacation in a foreign country within the next six months. And this, hmm. this is a... What a chart. It's a massive rise from... So it, it's showing more than one in five people, almost one in four people, are planning to leave the country for a vacation in the next six months. And still, we could trace this back to COVID. It's, uh, we're what, three, and a, three years removed? So someone wrote in, I, talk, I complained a couple weeks ago that the JW Marriott and Marco is just ridiculously higher priced than it was uh, even a few years ago. And it's called capitalism, son. <laughs> someone responded and said, it used to be seasonal travelers, right? And that's why you'd get a spike at spring break probably and some other Christmas or wherever. But now it's it's year round, people coming to visit. <laughs> Unbelievable. And I think that's that's part of it. By the way, just real quick, I, uh, before I don't want to gloss over this on the inflation part. You know who thinks inflation is going to be higher for longer? The market. Look at the bond market. It's it's hard. To, well, you say the market does, but it hasn't impacted the stock market though. So why is that? Well, I, I don't see that as. Uh, I feel like you're, that's a, you're, that's a, you're deflecting. I'm talking about the bond market. Okay, so the two-year yield is back to, oh, wow, 5% again for the two-year. 10 years, and the four, ten years, seven. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, the bond market is, uh, remember the meme? The, the, this meme with the bond market, something like that? It, I just have trouble trusting the bond market because it was caught so off sides the last time when rates shot up to 5%. Or so you don't, you, don't trust, you don't trust the CPI subcomponents going higher. You don't trust the bond market. What do you trust? I have nothing. No one. 
I don't, that's why this is so hard because this year, none of these years have worked out how anyone thought they would. This year, we we're going to have six rate cuts, but it was because the economy was going to be slowing. And, and if anything, the economy just. Here, listen, you could say these two things. Clearly, inflation is, well, maybe not clearly. Inflation is not going in the right direction temporarily that we would hoped. And the bond market is confirming that. You could also say that that doesn't mean that the bond market is right. Yes. and I, I, But for now, that's how it's interpreting the the data that we've And been I think receiving. the stock market agrees with me. Three and a half percent inflation with like 6% nominal GDP growth is way better than one or two percent inflation and three percent nominal GDP growth, right? Because the fact that it's inflation is not slowing means growth is not slowing. So that, I think that's why the stock market says, okay, game on. Earnings are going to be higher. Yeah. Th listen, this is a phenomenal excuse for the stock market to cool off. And it looks like the market is taking that. Uh, yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. It's like, it. uh, I'm surprised that the excuse isn't being used more. Like, let's let's do it. But I, I mean, I guess we did just have a 10% correction in October. Uh, okay, Wall Street Journal has a piece. Got shared pretty widely on social media. I don't think of myself as rich. Americans crossing Biden's $400,000 tax line. Now, this is supposed to be a, an article about uh, $400,000 being like the line in the sand now for you should pay higher tax. And it's supposed to be a tax article. But to me, this is a how do you view yourself article. And am I really rich? So Nobody views himself as rich. It's pretty, it's pretty incredible. That's the, that's, that was my takeaway. So according to this article, 2.6% of households make $400,000 or more. It's a very small share. They also have this, this chart where they show it by state. And so Michigan is, I don't know, less than 2%. New York is one of the higher ones. I guess DC is the highest at 6.1%. But I mean, come on. We're, are we really calling DC a state? No. All right, only for the... But they, so they have these, these people they interviewed in here. And this, this one guy says, I don't think of myself, he makes 400 grand or something. I don't, I don't think of myself as rich. I think of myself as having worked really hard. Uh, I've hit the American dream and I'm going to have to pay more taxes. That doesn't feel great to me. It's demotivating. Another person actually said, we have a pretty- Wait, wait, wait. But wait, I just, on that, that's an interesting quote. I don't think of myself as rich. I think of myself as having worked really hard. Because in, in that person's mind, they don't like to be called rich because they feel like it, it cheapens the work that they put in. They, 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 he, they hear rich, but they think luck. They think that people are calling them lucky. Where it's like, no, I'm not lucky. I worked hard. But it's like, but no, you're actually rich and you worked hard. That's okay. In fact, that's better than okay. That's phenomenal. That's what this country- It is almost like- Part of what makes this country great. You could only be called rich if you're like the succession kids where like the money was just handed to you. Those are the real rich well, people. Because it's, it's, there's nothing more relative than wealth and income. And that, that's the whole point. This other person says, uh, first of all, that this person says in Kentucky, like our money goes really far, but they said, but we're not extravagant people with high-end country club memberships or a private jet or anything like that. What percentage of people do you think actually fly on private jets? Is it the 0.1%? Zero point, zero point what? I mean, point, the 0.1% maybe? I would say there's like multiple decimal places, 0. 0.0. Well, yeah, I guess it's 0.1% 0. 0. probably do. But I guess that th this is another downfall of the information age is you just, it's so clear that there are other people who have these other things that you don't have. And so you don't ever get to the point where you feel rich. Yeah, because now you're not just comparing yourself to your friends; you're comparing yourself to celebrities on Instagram, and that's a tough, that's a tough hurdle to clear. Yeah, so it it, it is just kind of sad that people who are in the top two or three percent still don't feel rich for whatever reason. All right, the FT yeah. had a piece. I feel like if if you really want to boil down why the economy has remained strong, and maybe why bond market yields are strong and inflation is strong, can we just blame it all on the millennials and boomers? Like millennials are coming up and making more money. Boomers already have all the money. They're spending like crazy. Is it as simple as demographics? Like you don't fight the demographic wave. What do you mean exactly? Just think about. I mean, well, the reason why I say that is because aren't millennials and boomers like eighty percent of the population or more? That's what I'm saying. And millennials have now risen above this this period where they you know had a tough time and they didn't have money. Now they have more money. The older ones at least bought houses. They own some stocks. And millennials are going to be inheriting that baby boomer money in the years ahead. I'm not saying there's not going to be setbacks along the way, but is that just an economic force for, I don't know, a couple decades here? Good luck yes. fighting it. Yeah. So the FT had this piece where actually inequality between 
like millennials and boomers is way worse than a place like England. So they they look at the top 10% of millennials and boomers in the average. And this is again, this is in this is in Britain. And the top 10% of millennials are doing way, way better than the boomers at their age. But the average millennial is way behind. And I'll scroll down mm. a little bit and look at in the US. It's actually right on track. And millennials are actually doing a huh. little better in some cases. So this this generational inequality is way, way worse in Britain than it is here. Their young people have a much bigger complaint. Interesting. I thought so too. So, but again, our millennials are either right on track with baby boomers across that they break it out by different wealth percentiles. And at the highest end, millennials are actually doing better. Did you read this piece by Derek Thompson about how much people work? So no. he goes back to like the 1800s and the average married couple back then worked 68 hours a week. By 1965, he says, after massive tech and social changes, the average married couple was working 67 hours a week. 2003, 67 hours a week. 2020, 67 hours a week. The thing is, I actually believe the numbers in like 1800 and 1965 that people probably did really work 67 hours a week. Do you think people kind of lie about how much they work these days? Is it really work? Like, no offense to you and me, but we're not exactly out in the farm, you know, plowing the fields. Like, that, that's work, right? Like, actual manual labor. We're sitting in front of a computer. We read some stuff. We're on some calls. Uh, we have time to check social media occasionally. I mean, listen, I'm not saying we don't work hard. We work hard. But <laughs> there's a difference between working hard in a knowledge field and working hard in manual labor, which most people used to do in the past. So I think sure. people say they work a lot these days, but it's way easier than ever to kind of shut your brain off and coast a little bit these days than it was in the past. Totally. Is that fair? Yes. Totally, totally. Uh, well, the real estate market's still screwed since the last time we spoke about it, seven days ago. Okay. I have a real estate question for you. So about a mile okay. from my house, speaking of really rich people, this, sound, this sounds like kind of a flex for me, but it's not. There's a billionaire family that has a huge plot of land about a mile from my house. It's like this enormous piece of land with woods all around it, and they built like a fake lake in it, and it's acres and acres of land. And they, they do a bunch of building way in the back. You can't even see. They're building a new house. In the last couple months, I've noticed there's these little houses that have been there forever that kind of are on the outskirts of their property. And two of them now have been knocked down by bulldozers, two of these houses. I can't say for sure. My guess is this billionaire family is paying these people to say, go away. We want to knock your house down for more privacy. Even though they have, they have plenty of land. There's, they're not even close. So a billionaire comes up to your door and says, kind of like Mike, I think Mark Zuckerberg did this and wherever he built his house in California, he bought like the four houses around him and knocks them down, you know, and give himself more privacy. Knowing the mortgage market right now with rates back at 7.4% or whatever, what kind of premium price would you need on your house for a billionaire to say, I want you out of there tomorrow, pay cash? Because you'd need a premium for that situation, right? Because you know, what would premium would you, would you accept? I don't know. What's reasonable? Like maybe double over what my new replacement cost would be. So if I'm spending an extra $100,000 a year on a mortgage, that sounds ludicrously high, but whatever. Let double that. Whatever it is, I double it. The funny thing is, is if you calculated what it would be, the extra cost, it probably is, it's, it's, it's high. Actually, no, my house with a new mortgage, I, no, I looked at it, it would be over 10 grand. So that's over a hundred thousand dollars. So I don't know, give me a quarter mil. You'd capitalize on it. Yeah. No, but wait, but I, I need a, I need a hassle premium. That's Let's what I Let's make it a cool million. It would, it would, yeah. it would be a big premium on what your price is. No, moving is a, moving is a hassle. So if I was selling a house, I'd be getting worried now that rates continue to stay above 7%. I'd be, it's 7.4 as of yesterday for the 30 year fixed. This is way longer than anyone thought mortgage rates would stay this high. The Redfin did their average payment on a median house at, at regular rates, hit another new all-time high, double the 2021 levels. I think what's going to happen is you're going to be get a more bifurcated housing market where there are, start, there are going to be areas where the supply is still low and you're going to have some bidding wars. Like someone tweeted to me after I wrote about real estate last week and he said, I listed my house, 14 showings in two days. Uh... First offer came at 11% over asking with no contingencies. 
So he said, been in the house for seven years and has appreciated 60% with no res- renovation. So this that kind of stuff is still happening. But I think there's going to be other places where with rates this high, the buyers are going to be like, wait a minute, I, I'm not going to give give up all this for the housing cost so high. So I think we're going to start seeing areas that do better or worse depending on the supply dynamics. You know what's in a correction? Home builders down 9.5%. Home Depot down 15%. That makes sense with rates staying high. Home Depot needs that home equity to become unlocked and get 5% rates again or something, right? Yeah, we had a few people email in. Hey, Ben, I'm curious to hear you talk about taking money out of your home. What would you do with it? I'd honestly probably just, this is this is the scenario if, if mortgage rates are at 3 or 4% again. Honestly, it'd probably just sit in cash for a while until I needed it for something. I wouldn't like immediately so you, go invest it in something. I would just pull it so out to have be it op- there. You, you'd be opportunistic. Yes. I wouldn't like, I wouldn't take it and immediately do something with it. I would have it there. What does Buffett say? You borrow when you can, not when you need to. Something like that. I'm being yeah, warm buffed like with my it. home equity. I like it. I, I really no, wouldn't answer, do anything. You know, that, that's the right answer. When somebody asks you a question, you quote Warren Buffett. <laughs> Even if the quote's probably wrong. Don't, <laughs> don't take my word for it. Yeah. Listen to Buffett. Listen to Buffett's words. Yeah, that's true. You can't argue with that. No. Uh, oh, this is a good email. Had to comment on the living full-time and vacation location. By the way, this is something that I feel very strongly about. I feel like I'm very enlightened when it comes to this. Like, I, 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 am, a, I am very aware of the grass is greener bias, right? Yes. It's a big thing. Okay. I, I am a North Jersey native and I've been on Oahu for 19 years. Came out here in 2005. Uh, bu, 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 bu. People ask me all the time how great it is living in Hawaii. And yeah, it's a cool place. But if you're here full time, you end up living like you do in any city in the US. I do exactly what my buddies do uh, in New York or Boston or whatever. Work, wife, kids, kids events, house maintenance, traffic, uh, Warm weather, no snow, and beach access can only mask so much. The, uh, you need to live where you have family and friend opportunities, feel safe, where you can afford to make a career, and in a place that you feel culturally included. Otherwise, when the novelty of the weather dissipates, you'll be a fish out of water. It is interesting. The, the novelty of it kind of goes away, even a beautiful place like Hawaii. Yeah, we adjust really quickly. So you Upwards and downwards. So it works both ways, Like, which is great that we're resilient. We can adjust to worsening economic conditions or life conditions, but it works the opposite way. Right. I think con- you get used to things. Luxuries become become necessities and they become uh, whatever, just part of life. I think Kahneman actually did a, a study about this, saying people who move to California because they want to get the nice weather, they just get acclimated to it eventually. And it, it doesn't it, it doesn't impact their life better or worse in the end. I also think this is situationally dependent on their personality. Yes. Um, but generally speaking, I think we just we adjust pretty quickly. Yes. Like if I lived somewhere that was nice year round, I would definitely be outside more doing stuff outside all the time. Yeah, well, for sure. And that that would impact your overall mental health. It's nice outside and I feel so much better. Yes, it is true. Uh, but do we appreciate it more because we have the crappy times? So exactly. That's why I love New York. Sometimes the weather sucks for a long period of time. And every time I leave, I get like a 30% weather premium. You know? So I don't, what a lot of people, some people, when they leave New York for vacation, like, why the hell do I live in New York? I'm the opposite. Right. I love leaving and I love coming home. Uh, all right. We're a silver linings podcast. Somebody emailed us over the last year. I have reflected on some of the positives. Maybe silver linings is a better term for this environment. Talking about housing. High rates kept us honest for what we could actually afford. Instead of a seven, $800,000 house, we may have been able to buy with a 3% mortgage. We bought a house for five fifty dollars with a monthly payment we can stomach at our 6.99% rate. Instead of heating and cooling and cleaning a 3,000 square foot house, We only have to deal with keeping up our 1,900 square foot house, which is much more manageable. Also, furnishing costs are lower for our smaller home. Our property taxes increased 10% the first year. This was much easier to handle in our cheaper home than it would have been if we had a large and more expensive home. The three-bed, two-bath, 1,900 square foot house we bought is a great starter home, which we will comfortably be able to raise two children for at least the first four to five years of their life. We are currently childless and with the plan to have kids in the future. It's nice to be able to meet their needs with the possibility of upgrading to a nicer home in the future. And lastly, we have the potential to get an unexpected raise. If we can ever refinance to a lower rate in the 4 to 5% range, that will be a significant cut to our cost of living. This will feel like a nice raise that we can use to pay for all the kids' stuff or have some family fun. 
credit to this person for having that mentality. See, not and complaining. Thank you for sharing. This is a this is a perfect Ben Carlson glass. This is a person. This person has it. This person has it all figured out. I love. I love. That's actually the interesting thing about the don't have to clean as much. You don't get this big of property tax increases. I like the way they're looking this is at the is This person is wise. That's wisdom. That is wisdom is. right there. All right. Uh, all right. How much do you need to retire? This is a study from Northwestern Mutual. $1.5 million, according to 4,600 adults. Sure, $1.5 million. Uh, millennials say they need $1.65 million, up from just under $1 million in 2020. So that millennials have given themselves a 60% raise in, in retirement. I'm sorry, this is such a dumb exercise. <laughs> how, would a, how, would a, how would I know? I'm 38 years old. No, I'm not. I'm 39. I'm 39. How would I know how much I need to retire? You really don't. You don't know how much you're going to spend then. You don't know what your health is going to be. Yeah, you know what? I don't know. $4 million bucks. Does that sound right? I have no idea. Yeah. And no one, and the, the truth is, since we know that there's, I think, what, 5% of Americans are millionaires, something like that, if you take out houses, so if we're just talking savings, people make do without becoming a millionaire in retirement. Yes. Millions and yes. millions of them do it every year. They make do with social security. How much do you need to retire with? You will retire with however much money you have and not a cent more or less. Yeah, maybe the, maybe the question should be rephrased. How much do you want to retire with? That's it, the answer people are giving. This is how much I want to retire with. All right, so anyway, what else is in here? Anything? No, that's it. All right, we haven't done an anti-survey uh, uh, PSA in a while. I saw somebody tweet, this is John B. Holbein on Twitter. How many people go to church weekly? Survey says it's about one in five Americans. Cell phone tracker data say it's actually closer to one in 20 Americans. Holy shit, mind blown. So Kyla Scanlon tweeted a link to a Torsten Slack post from 2023 that we missed, Ben. At least I think we missed it. I don't remember going over this. There's a chart showing the structural decline in response rates to surveys. Ah, and I like it. The, I mean, we were ahead of the game here. These things are totally bogus. People don't respond anymore. Why would they? So that's great. So people... This is watch what they do now, what they say. So one in five people say, yeah, I go to church, but it's really- And it's really closer to one in 20. Wow. That's do, I mean, do we rest our case? Is this not the coup de grace? It is. Nailed it. All right. Uh, financial advice is really dumb sometimes. There's a Wall Street Journal article. It's like six mistakes or f avoiding these financial mistakes before you retire in the next five years. And one of them says overspending on your children. And they talk about this guy. He says uh, this- this attorney has a estate planning attorney has a client who spent so much on one of his adult children that he has to work longer as a result. He's using his salary to support himself and one of his kids. If he didn't have to support them, he could have retired already, which is, yeah, if guess what? If I didn't have kids, I probably could have retired already. And do you think this guy would feel much better about himself if he retired early and let one of his kids flounder <laughs> and not, and not, uh. what, do you, what is he really? He'd feel better about himself in that situation. Listen, I say to Kobe and Logan every day before I give them a kiss and put them on the bus, don't forget, in 20 years, you are on your <laughs> own. See you later. Picking the <laughs> rear end. But yeah, I'm sure this guy feels better about being able to help his kids, even though it's not helping his own situation. So Ben, I'm in a bit of a, a dry spell. I don't know if it's dry with, with things on TV to watch. Um, and I've, so I've been doing more, more scrolling. Max has gone to absolute trash shit. There's nothing there. Well, it's harder to find the quality stuff now. What do you mean? Just in general? Because they just keep adding these other services there and it's, it's reality shows and yeah. Uh, but there's nothing, there's not, I mean, it used to be a good library. I don't know what happened. Maybe it's me, but I, I can't seem to find anything. And you know what, conversely, you know what's actually got a pretty decent library? Peacock. Not bad. You know, the, the problem is there's so many streamers now. It used to be where every month you'd get a ton of churn and you get a bunch of new movies here and a bunch of new movies there. And now they all, all own their own libraries and they're not sharing as much anymore. So there's no there's not as much change. So when you scroll, you feel like you're seeing the same thing over and over again and nothing new over, because that's the best part. It's being like, oh, I didn't know this was streaming and I watch that now. You don't get yeah. that as much anymore. Yeah. Um, we got a bunch of emails talking about why do Midwesterners go to the West Coast of Florida, East coasters go to the east coast it's the highways yeah i mean we it's, totally miss that so. <laughs> it's that highway goes to this side this highway yeah. goes to that side it, it was as easy as that ben i've had several experiences in the last call it two to three weeks where people have either just been dicks for lack of a better word just i am i am of the ilk just do the right thing 
even if it's uncomfortable, even if it is something that you, you're potentially giving somebody news that they, you don't think they want to hear, sometimes you just, owe, you just owe it to somebody to just tell them the truth, right? Okay. And so I've had a few experiences with that that, re- that annoyed me. I've had some customer service issues that really annoyed me, <clears throat> Audi. But then on the flip side, I had two experiences that were so wonderful that uh, almost made me even more mad about the way that certain people handled certain situations. I'll give you an example. I bought, when we were in Colorado Springs, I bought, there was a boutique, like a antique store with all sorts of really, really cool stuff. They had like uh, Lincoln signatures and swords from Gettysburg and George Washington pictures and signatures and Declaration of Independence, like really, really neat stuff. Those would make awesome NFTs. Yes, totally. Uh, That's what I was thinking. And so I bought a map from 1964 of Long Island. And she shipped it to me. And it like, it, it, it sort of, it's, I guess it's glued to the parchment paper. I don't know what I'm talking about, but it, it, it fell down. And so it was crooked. And I emailed her and her response was, I'm so sorry. We found a local re- restoration place or whatever. It's already paid for it. Just go drop it off. Wow. I was like, that's, that's how you treat people. That's hospitality. That's customer and service. That's, you would recommend that place to someone else in the future, right? Hey, 100%. Check this place I out. made it. My, I don't, I'm not a collector, but maybe, who knows? Maybe I'll go back. Another example, I signed a contract where the person, it's a monthly fee. The person told me the fee verbally or, or via email, the fee that they quoted was higher than the fee that was actually in the DocuSign, the legal document. So I signed it and I said, hey, just an FYI, there was a disparity. And this person said, that's on me, uh, you know, keep it. Like, we'll, we'll honor what we put in the contract. Not a mistake, right? And I said, you know what? Like, good for you. I really, really appreciate that. Like, way to start a relationship. And uh, it's just like simple things. And I don't mean to lecture, but the the people that like didn't do the right thing, it was just like such common decency, like courtesy, right? Just get back to people. Like, don't leave them hanging. Just common shit. And so when you see something good, it really stood out. And I don't know where I'm going with that, but I just wanted to share. Golden rule. I tell it to my kids all the time, right? Treat people the way you want to be treated. There you go. It's a very simple rule of life. Um, all right. So speaking of recommendations and streaming. Uh, oh, Neil Brennan has a new special on Netflix. He's one of the few comedians that can consistently like make me laugh out loud and not just say like, huh, that's funny. Very intelligent humor too. Did you watch, did you watch it yet? I didn't. I didn't know there was a new one. Okay. Uh, yeah. There's a few, there's a few really good bits in there. So, okay. So I saw Civil War. M- highly anticipated. The trailer looked incredible, right? Um, and I went to an AMC theater on opening night. Is AMC still in business? And there was myself and my friend and four other people. Oh, so it was empty. I mean, opening night. For a movie that did decent, I think it did $26 million over the weekend, something like that. Uh, and this was an IMAX slated type of movie. IMAX did release it. And it would have been great in IMAX. And I, I'm not going to give any spoilers. So I, I almost hesitate to say anything about the movie. Um, other than I will say that I very, very much enjoyed it. And I think it definitely got a 20 to 30% in theater premium. Okay. Even though no one else was there. Well, just, yeah. The experience of, of the bullets whizzing by and it just being really loud. And it was effective. I thought it was really well done. Okay. So last week I said... Great movie plot would be listening to an old song and it takes you back to that time. And this wasn't like a deja vu moment for me. I, I'd never seen the previews. There was well, li- I was having I was having the deja vu moment and I couldn't th- I couldn't remember That's what true. it was. There was literally a movie that came out on Hulu like this week called The Greatest Hits. That that is the plot. What is the plot? <laughs> you listen to a song and it brings you back in time. To like the, what I said is is literally the plot of a movie. So I guess it was. Oh, I love it. I guess it was too easy. It looks okay. Hmm. I didn't recognize any of the actors, but it's like a rom com where someone dies and she goes back to see with them because she keeps listening to the songs that they like. All right, Got it. Uh, I highly recommend the Steve Martin doc on Apple. It Apple is one of them that I feel like they don't really advertise much. You turn on Apple TV. You said you know you you turn on something, 
there'll just be something with a really good, and so it's a two-part doc, and I, I, I'm a huge, huge fan of Seabart, and he was, his whole shtick was, I'm going to be like the overconfident idiot, and my co- comedy stand-up is going to be so weird that it's going to stand out to people, and it, it's, the funny thing is, is it's, it's not even technically funny, his stand-up, but the way he does it makes it funny. <laughs> If that, and he, yeah, you know, it's such a great, it's such a great point. I've never seen a standup, but obviously I found him to be incredibly, uh, entertaining. That he's just entertaining. Um, and it's, and he said, he says, but is he funny? I mean, obviously he's funny, but not traditionally funny. No, not, it's not like he's doing setups and punchlines and stories. He's just being a goofball. And he's like, that's what he, right. he said. I just wanted to make people happy. And they show the people in the crowd and everyone had the biggest smile on their face. And he's like, that's all I wanted. And then he gets to the peak and he walks away. And it's it's honestly just an excellent, excellent, He just his whole thinking about it and how he'd set it up. And uh, it's really, really good. Uh, okay, I also got into Ripley on Netflix. I have a lot of, I have a lot of thoughts on it. You asked me, should I watch it? And I said, no for you yeah. because it's okay, probably you. too slow. So I didn't realize this. It's literally the talented Miss Ripley, but instead of a movie, yeah. and that's one of my favorite movies from the 90s. I think- 70% of that movie is excellent. The last 30% is just kind of, eh. Yeah. But that movie has Matt Damon and Jude Law and Gwyneth Paltrow and Philip Seymour Hoffman and Kate Blanchett. So it's it's just, a, and this is before any of them were and huge. And the, that guy, uh, the dad? Yes, the, yeah, Dickie Greenleaf's dad. So this new one, my, I'm going to say good things and bad things about it. The first, the bad. Well, the, the it's hard to not compare it to the original movie because, I again, I love the movie so much. But the, the whole show is in black and white, which Duncan, I know Duncan is a fan of black and white because he's a cinephile. Italy is one of the most beautiful places on earth and I can't see it in color. It, it boggles my mind why they made this decision. How many episodes have you watched? I think I'm a six in. So the thing is- Oh, so you're, you're in. Oh, I'm in. It's, it's, very, it's, it's very slow and a little way more tedious than the original, but it's very good. It's, so do you stand by the, I won't like it? I think- so. Try an episode. See what you think. It's you know I I really appreciate that, and that's one of my that's one of my uh, meaningless superpowers. Is when you say to me, "Hey, you won't like this." I love it. I don't get offended. I, it's the opposite. Thank you for not wasting my time. I said that to Chris the other day. I said, "Oh, this isn't for you." And he goes, "What does that mean?" Yeah, everyone. That's just and, taste. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm doing you a favor. That's what it means. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> so I have a hard pro- time comparing it to the original because I love the original so much. Jude Law is like the most charismatic guy in the world on that. Uh, but the black and white really irritates me, but I, I, whatever, I can move past that. The guy who plays Ripley, Andrew Scott, he's, he played Moriarty on, did you ever watch the Benedict Cumberbatch Sherlock Holmes? Mm-mm. It was, it was really good. He plays the bad guy in that. He also is the priest in Fleabag season two, remember? And he's so good. He, he as Ripley is so creepy and good. Like he's better than Matt Damon as Ripley. All the other characters in the movie are better than the characters that are on the TV show. But him as Ripley is he's so so good, and uh, so yeah, it it's it's like the movie, but more slow and a little tedious. And they made some different choices, but that's where I'm at on Ripley. And, but I, if you're like a film person, you're gonna say this is the most beautiful thing ever. I, the black and okay. white thing. The only thing times black and white has ever worked ever in anything is Schindler's List and the Three Stooges. That's it. Otherwise, <laughs> color. Wait, no, no, no. I mean, there's others, but Casablanca, I know you won't see movies from the past, but you really should see that movie. I watched a little bit of it. I, I can't watch movies before 1970. So, but let, let's say Netflix <laughs> did an A-B test and they said, here's Ripley in color and here it is in black and white. How many people would choose to watch it in black and white? If, the, if you had two Duncan. options, 1%, maybe? Yeah, yeah. That's all I got. All right, Animal Spirits at the Compound News. Uh, thank you for listening. Ben, I'll see you tomorrow. That's right, I'm coming to New York. I'll see you then. And we'll see you next week.